Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode from my series Quick Falls On, in which I always talk about different stories from the rich Star Trek universe. 30 years and 5 months ago, the next episode of Star Trek The Next Generation aired. It was called We'll Always Have Paris, and these are my honest opinions about it. I say it openly, this episode, in my humble opinion, is one of the best episodes of the first season of Star Trek The Next Generation. I'm not sure about the scientific stuff in this episode, but I love the character stuff. The Enterprise is on its way to Sarona 8 for the well-deserved shore leave. The Captain spends his time with some fencing, when suddenly the Enterprise experiences a hiccup, as Data calls it. A few seconds of the fencing match repeats themselves, and when Picard calls the bridge, he finds out that the whole ship was affected by this very strange phenomenon. He returns to the bridge to get some more intel, when suddenly they receive an automated distress call from Professor Paul Mannheim. Everybody notices Picard's reaction, but he simply brushes it off saying that he knows who Mannheim is. Fifteen years ago, uh, he and his scientific team left Earth to experiment with nonlinear time, which means that these two incidents uh, should be related. When Picard wants to leave the bridge and go change into his uniform, Diana tells him how she noticed that every mention of Mannheim's name caused a strong emotional response in him, and recommends him to use the remaining hours until they arrive to the coordinates uh, to analyze his feelings. Picard first ignores her, but then decides to go to the holodeck. He recreates a small cafe called Café de Artistes, pardon my French, in all meanings of the term, in Paris 22 years ago, and we can admire the wonderful matte painting of the Eiffel Tower. Well, it is beautiful, I just don't understand why the café has a matte painting visible from the balcony. Picard then stares at two sexy women who are young enough to be his daughters, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. The other one, named Gabriel, is waiting for a guy who didn't come. Picard explains to her that the young man is probably just a coward. Then he gets annoyed with himself because it probably opens some old wounds of his, as we will soon find out, and gets back to the bridge. Riker explains to him that the effect was felt everywhere in their part of the space, when they finally reach the given coordinates. Instead of finding Mannheim, they get different coordinates. Somebody is playing with them, and unfortunately, this part of the plot doesn't get resolved in this episode. So my typical question, why is it here? Finally, they reach the correct coordinates at Vendor 4, a small planetoid orbiting a binary system, but there is a force field active, preventing them from beaming somebody there or out. They get audio contact by a woman, and it's apparent by Picard's reaction that he knows her. When she lowers the force field, they beam her and Mannheim directly to the sick bay. Picard goes down there with Data and Riker, and introduces them to Janice Mannheim. And from the reactions of both Janice and Jean-Luc, it's pretty clear that they don't only know each other, but something more. Much more. To be perfectly honest, for years I thought that she is the older version of the young girl from the holodeck simulation. Only now, when I rewatched it after a few years, I noticed that the holographic girl was named Gabrielle, and the real one is Janice. Strange, why did the computer create a young woman waiting for a man who didn't arrive? Of course, Picard was 22 years ago the man who should come for a date with Janice, but he was a coward, so he didn't come and left no explanation. But back to the present. 
Janice explains that there have been two accidents. During the first one, all of the scientists, except for her husband, died. During the second one, Mannheim himself opened a window to another dimension, which was the cause for the temporal anomalies. So of course our heroes must close the window now. Not only to save Mannheim, who seems to be partially still in that other dimension, but to save the whole quadrant. There is some great acting and directing in this scene, especially when Beverly sees how Janice kisses Jean-Luc on the cheek. I love the fact that nobody of them talks about their emotions, but still it's absolutely clear what every one of them is feeling. I miss scenes like this. Anyway, Picard, Data and Riker go inside the turbo lift, when suddenly the door opens and they see themselves again entering the turbo lift. That's such a cool little scene and the funny thing is that we continue with the versions of the crew who is uh, right now standing outside of the turbo lift and not the version which is inside the turbo lift. If you understand what I'm trying to say. Great, I love this type of stuff and I'd wish there was more of it. Riker, Data and Worf try to beam down to the lab, but there is some defense mechanism which prevents them from beaming there and the transporter chief almost loses them. Fortunately only almost, but something more interesting happens on the bridge. When Picard and Troy are nervous, they stand up and Picard demands to know what the hell is going on. The camera clearly shows that there is Stasha Yar standing behind of them. You know, the same Tasha Yar who died in the previous episode? What the hell happened? I tried to find some information about this online and the only thing I found was that it was an editing mistake. But what exactly does it mean? Was this shot uh, filmed originally for a different episode, but it was dropped and used uh, here instead? I would really love to know the reasoning behind of this. Anyway, Mannheim uh, meanwhile wakes up and wants to talk to Picard. When he arrives with Data, Mannheim explains that he indeed opened the window to another dimension, but when he realized how far did the effect spread, he wanted to close it, but failed. Which means it's Data's turn now. He gives them transporter coordinates and the security codes, but Picard wants Data to go there alone. He then gets a chance to talk finally privately to Janice. And they do have a pretty good chemistry. I hate saying it, but part of me always wishes that Paul Mannheim dies and Jean-Luc can get together with Janice. Troy decides that it's a good idea to talk to Beverly about her feelings and again they hint that Picard and Crusher love each other, but this hinting is all we get during the whole series, until the final episode in which we are told they later get married and divorced. We can clearly see that Beverly is jealous, why did Roddenberry not allow the two of them to be together? Picard talks to Mannheim in privately and Paul tells him that he doesn't know if he remembers all of the security codes, but I'm sure nothing bad will all happen, right? But the more important thing is that he basically offers his wife to Picard, in the case that something bad will happen to him. Come on screenwriters, why do you want me to hope that Mannheim dies? He's such a nice guy, I don't want to see him dead. Data beams down, and who would say? Mannheim has indeed forgotten, quote unquote, to tell them about one phaser, which of course activates and tries to shoot Data. Wouldn't it be fun if this was actually intentional from him? A part of some kind of a bigger plan? How to beam Picard down to his lab, where he would then be, quote unquote, accidentally killed? But maybe it's just my imagination. Anyway, Data is awesome. So he destroys the phaser before it can destroy him and gets safely to the lab. 
He takes some antimatter and wants to put it into the opening uh, to close the rift permanently. When the next distortion appears, which should be in 90 seconds. But wait, how does he take antimatter using matter? Shouldn't matter and antimatter annihilate each other? Wasn't there a whole episode about that in TOS? Ah, uh, whatever. When data approaches the thing, suddenly the distortion happens and there are now suddenly three datas. One is only taking the antimatter, the second one is on his way to the thing, and the third one is standing next to the thing. So, which one is in the correct position? Well, the middle one claims that he is the one. So, how does he know that? I don't get it, but that's okay, because data is awesome. The middle data closes the window and the anomalies stop. But unfortunately, or fortunately, I honestly don't know, that means that Mr. Mannheim is now suddenly okay, and of course Janice wants to stay with her husband. I'm not sure if that's a happy ending, and based on the look on Picard's face, even he doesn't know if this is a happy ending, but the crew can now go to their well-deserved holiday and they already plan how they will get drunk. That sounds like a great plan. This is one of my favorite TNG episodes from the first season. It has a perfect mix of, let's call it sci-fi weirdness, and character-oriented subplot. It has absolutely perfect acting and really great editing. I wouldn't get out of my mind the idea that I know the woman uh, who played Janice from somewhere, but thanks to Uncle Google I now know it. She was a singer in The Mamas and the Papas. On a technical note, um, if you watch this episode on the Blu-ray, which you should by the way, because the Blu-ray release of TNG is simply a labor of love, you will notice that one shot of Commander Raker looks much, and I mean much worse than the rest. It's because it is not transferred from film, but upscaled from the NTSC DVD and slightly color corrected. It really is notable, but fortunately it's so short that unless you have your eyes uh, on your TV constantly, there is a chance that you will miss it. This is a great episode, but as I said, it has many small problems. Which means that on my standard scale from 0 to 10, where 0 is complete garbage, 5 is average, and 10 is a masterpiece, I would give this episode 8 out of 10. It's very, very good. But as always, these were just my opinions, let me know what do you think down in the comment section. If you like this video, please hit that thumbs up button, and if you have some free time, feel free to watch any of the other videos on my channel. Thank you very much for watching and see you soon. Bye.